fire and throw and all this work you know and just give me your sins as we say chapter 2 and we'll commence to read at verse 39 verse 39 and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord they returned into Galilee to their own city Nazareth and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them 
and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and man. And let us always remind ourselves that this is the word of the Lord. I realise that there are quite a number of folk, obviously, that are using the YouTube channel. And I know there are those that don't belong to the church here. I am those that maybe you wouldn't get through the church door here who uh, listen to the services on YouTube. And I know that it is maybe that wee bit more difficult whenever we decide to switch from one week into another. But for those who will have part one this morning on YouTube, you may remember that last week we said we would preach on the subject of I uh, finding the right balance in our Christian lives. And this morning I want us to go into part two, but I realise in order to do that, we need to recap a little bit as to where we left off last Lord's Day morning. You may re remember, for those of you that were here, that I asked a question by way of introduction. Have you ever wondered what Jesus looked like? And I said that perhaps we I wonder as to what way did he dress? What colour of skin did he have? We know the Bible tells us about some of the places that he frequented. We know there's other places that he avoided. We read about the things that he enjoyed doing. And then last week also I said that one thing I discovered from the Word of God is I reckon that Jesus loved or liked fish. And we read about him eating fish. And so we will all have our recollections and our minds from Sunday school days to little flashcards and pictures as to the way we think the Lord Jesus looked whenever he was here and there. But the fact of the matter is simply this here, that although we have all kinds of maybe extra uh, material in our minds as to what Jesus looked like, the Word of God is very, very silent, really, with regard to most of it. We know, of course, we read in the Word of God that there are those who pluck the hairs from his face, which would tell us, of course, that obviously Jesus I, had a beard. But there are some things that we can find from I, the Word of God. We said this last week, by way of introduction also, as to how whenever Jesus was 12 years of age, he went to the temple, and he was so taken up with his father's business that we're told that his mother and Joseph, his earthly father, didn't know that Jesus hadn't returned with them. Do you imagine what it's like today, even a 12-year-old, or even a younger child, perhaps you always warn them as to the importance of staying with you. But it's only natural for children to wander off on their own. And I'm sure for most of us, whenever our children were growing up, there were times maybe in some big store where if they wandered off, where purposely maybe you would hide behind something, would you still be keeping an eye on them? And you're trying to teach them the importance of staying close to you. But we're told here about the Lord Jesus that he in many ways said to his parents, wist ye not, are you not aware, that I must be about my father's business. But the verse that I really want to get to this morning 
is verse 52 and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and with man and so for those of you that perhaps are listening we did say last week as to how important it is that we find balance in our lives you may remember that we used the illustration of the wheel and the hub and how that if we look at our lives as the hub and all the spokes that come out of it the relationships the people that affect our lives as to how important it is to have the right hub or else so many other things will certainly fall down and so the fact is that we all build our lives around some sort of a hub the center of your life is critical to developing a balanced life a solid center leads to a solid life i don't want to go into all the psychological arguments by Bolve and I, I always looked at Freud as a wee bit of a weirdo for those who may have studied a bit of Freud's thinking but I think of people like Piaget and other psychologists who tells us about the importance of fulfilling our lives and the importance especially of the early years in our life now I would say that if we do not look after the hub as it were whether we're Christians or not Christians, it's so important to do that in order to create a stability in our lives. Make the Lord Jesus Christ the center of your life today if you don't know him yet as your saviour. We know that uh, whenever Jesus is the center of our lives, he is there to influence our lives, to direct our lives, to empower our lives, and to give to us stability in our Christian lives. And so that is so important. The Lord Jesus, whenever he was here on earth, he was always redeeming the time. He was making the most of his time. And I say all this reverently. He wanted to pour everything into the work of his Father God. Think of your body today. As we mentioned, the importance of having balance in our bodies and I know I would do as well sometimes to maybe take some things on board more with the responsibility of looking after our bodies you see sometimes people try to work seven days a week our bodies were never made for that the Lord did not make you or, or, or I for that matter to work seven days a week I mentioned last Lord's Day as to how I heard a testimony a way down uh, the dual carriageway many years ago of a faith mission pilgrim I knew her father well and her mother and she was the first one ever I, I heard tell in, in the meeting she told about her long hard struggle with depression as a young girl but her depression she said was linked to an imbalance in her body cells and we know that even in the body it's so important to have balance. You and I can become imbalanced on practically everything. We need balance in the workplace. We need balance with our family life. We need balance whenever it comes to sleeping, whenever it comes to working, whenever it comes to eating and to playing. We need balance, yes, in everything. You can be imbalanced in the way, in one way, with the use of your time with the use of your job your hobbies and so on it's very easy to become imbalanced perhaps the problem is that most of us have a tendency sometimes to work on the exterior and i know in counseling they will talk about the mask that we all wear the mask sometimes that will cover up and hide the real you and the real me i know that but sometimes we can work in our public lives and let the private lives slide. We work maybe on how we look. We work on how we talk, on how we dress, on how we smile. But sometimes we can forget about the inner 
man. I think it's true to say if there's one, and I'm not trying to publicise this paper by the way, but the only paper really that we get for a long, long time is usually the Times on a Saturday. It's just, to me, I give you very much a world view as to what's happening in the world. And uh, one of our, our family, I uh, very kindly, well, for a few months anyway, I'm sure, I'm not expected to last forever, decided to treat us to the Times online each day. If you're to buy the paper copy, it would cost you a fortune, but I must say, I do enjoy the Times. But last week in the Times, there was a, a rather uh, interesting piece, I thought, I read about it. I didn't take it on board, by the way. I don't know whether you would or not. But it talked about how that during lockdown, that men have aged five years. And I smiled. And I thought, what about the women? <laughs> There's no mention of them. But that men have aged five, uh, five years, and men are spending, and this, uh, there was this survey done, and then you have all these people, which I enjoy, who will write in their comments about the thing. But they're saying that men has aged five years during lockdown, been closed in and all the rest of it. And so what is happening, more and more men now are getting Botox. Now, that's what I've said, I've never taken this on board or that. But more and more men are spending more money on Botox, on injections, on maybe being able to say like an old car, being filled and respread, or, 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 or whatever. But how sometimes we're inclined to work on the exterior rather than on the interior. And so uh, we have to remember the inner man. People's lives, someone has described it like this, that we are more like photographs, overexposed and underdeveloped. You see, everyone sees us and knows us, and we have contact with people, but very often our private lives can be undeveloped. I mentioned in the prayer meeting the other night, and again I read this in the Times this week, as to this priest in France, and how he is divulging what people have confessed to him in the confessional box during lockdown. And again you have all these comments, some of them are very interesting. Why would you confess it to a man that has no power to forgive sins anyway? But some very interesting thinking. But this priest is saying as to how that 40% uh, or something of the confessions are linked to pornography. And then he was asked the question about what was the rarest confession, and he said somebody one day confessed to a murder in the confessional box. But he felt he couldn't divulge that. Now I always reckon, and I was always taught, that confidentiality is broken whenever your life is in danger or you're going to endanger someone else's life. I don't believe that any man has the right or the power to know about the content of a murder and yet not take some kind of action uh, to it. And so I remember, dear friends, today the importance in working in our lives. The world uh, has waited. Now, I am not one of them. I have to be honest today. I am not one of them. But the world has waited for this interview with Harry and Megan. To, I'm sure you're sick listening about it. Uh, Harry says this, Megan says that. And so I wouldn't, I, to be honest with you, I didn't even read it. I'm not really in the remotely interested. But I'm sure amongst the millions and millions of people that have viewed it, and probably many, many of you, not that there's anything wrong with that, we've all made our comments as to what way we think the facts are. I'm sure of that. But I, and how things uh, uh, maybe were affected in the family and so on. I, um, I want to say to your friends that I'm sure if I was to listen to them to you, which I haven't. I did read little snippets in the paper, but I, I, I didn't I read it. The problem is whenever our personal lives are not balanced, there's at least two things will happen to us. And I believe this will happen to the young as well as to the old. And maybe as I go through this, very short series and finding the right balance in our Christian lives, maybe there's some of these areas 
that you'll be able to identify with. I believe, first of all, that the problem is that will lead to is that of frustration. Frustration. I'm sure there are times whenever we've watched someone out on the street and they're doing a juggling act. And you wonder to yourself, how do they keep these things spinning on maybe a pole or something? Or they're juggling one thing against the other and we're, we're wondering, how do they keep all this uh, going together? And uh, I would say to your friends, a lot of our lives can be like that. We try to juggle things. I believe, now we all do it. I'm not st standing up here today and saying that I don't do it. We all do it. No matter who you are, you try to juggle things in life. But the fact is that even whenever we do that, some things may come to the wall. I would ask you this morning, what are you trying to juggle in your life today? What are you trying to juggle? Now, I did mention last Lord's Day morning, one of the commandments to honour our fathers and mothers that our days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth us. It's very important to do that and I know that today is a Mother Sunday and so probably you've all been pampered and, and so what? <laughs> I don't know. I, but I, I'll say this here dear friends, that maybe you're trying to juggle things today. You get one thing balanced in your life. And another thing falls down. Is that not so often the case? The second thing I believe that happens whenever we try to juggle so many things is fatigue. You get tired when your life is out of balance. You see, I am absolutely useless. I really do not deserve a car because I, I am the worst car owner. Do you know this? I looked at my car last night. I whenever I was going into the garage and the wheels are, I, are all curved. I, one day I was I, I had my brother in the car and I don't know, I seem to I bounce over a footpath. He thought, what on earth has happened here? But I'm afraid I'm not very good at looking after a car. That's why I probably don't deserve it. And it wasn't for my lads every so often and Father's Day or Christmas or that validating my car well to me the car is there to be used for the work and so that that's that's it well i'll say this here that if you get new tires in your car you need to get them balanced uh, if they're not balanced you will get a very bumpy kind of a ride you see the car doesn't handle the shocks and the bumps very well and that's what happens with our lives if our lives are not balanced. You see, if you get an imbalanced tire, eventually it will rub in the wrong place. You'll get a bald spot. I'm sure we've all been there. I miss my father for, my father always would have checked my car for oil. I wouldn't honestly know how, how to put the bonnet in my car, just out of the interest. But I, my father would sit, sit to me, did you check for water? Did you check for this? And I should, but I never, I never did. It just, I, the interest wasn't there. But you get a bald spot. And likewise in your life, there can be a bald spot, spiritually speaking. And that's why whenever there's a bald spot in our lives, it's good for us whenever maybe someone points out that bald spot, spot to us. Now we are to speak the truth in love. In love. Not out of hatred, not out of strife, not, out of, not for any of that, that, those reasons, but speak the truth in love. Again, if there's an imbalance in tires, well, you would say that there could be a bald spot. And our lives, if there's an imbalance, will be rubbed up the wrong way. And eventually there'll be a big blowout whenever there's the imbalance. Tires blow out. People born out because of imbalance. What does the Bible say about being balanced in our lives? I want to focus our attention on the most important person, that is the Lord Jesus. 
And that's how we can find balance in our lives. And so if you remember nothing else that I say today, remember these words in verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. How balanced Jesus was in the development of his life. If I was to type into some search engine today, whether Google or some other search engine on the computer, the word balanced or balanced life, you will get thousands and tens of thousands of responses and answers to it. You see, uh, you, you will come up with words like 10 tips for a balanced life. Five tips for better work-life balance. How to create a balanced life. 10 easy tips for a balanced life. And so it goes on and on. But I want to point out to us this morning that the Lord Jesus, and then we'll come into our own personal lives, the Lord Jesus developed a balanced life in four different areas. It is so important to have some kind of a balance. And I want us to focus primarily on the Lord Jesus. We're told here that he grew in wisdom. He grew. This is the Son of God. This is God in the flesh that Luke is describing. Now, I always liked Luke, I liked the other gospel writers too, but you have to remember that Luke was a doctor. And so Luke will fill in too sometimes the little magical bits whenever you read through the story of Luke, or the gospel of Luke. And so we read as to how Jesus increased in wisdom, he grew in wisdom. It means that he grew intellectually. Wisdom involves much more than knowledge. You remember Jesus was 12 years old here whenever he has gone with his parents uh, to uh, Jerusalem at the feast of the Passover. He's 12 and he grew in wisdom. Now, we have to remind ourselves that children grow and children develop. I was thinking whenever I was preparing this a few weeks ago because I did spend, because I was in the house for I spent a good while uh, preparing uh, these uh, few messages. I thought one day of an old lady that came to visit us whenever we were children. She came from Belfast, but she was from the country. She had been my grandest sister, and I didn't even know my grandest, so she probably was Victorian. But, you know, I remember this old lady coming from Belfast, and I, she was dressed in black. And I suppose some of us remember a generation, and that's the way they dressed. And I, she would have come and she sat at the head of the table and she would talk. And she had an old saying, and my father used to keep quoting it to us too, that his aunt Manny would say, you can't put an old head on young men's shoulders. Well, isn't that so true? We've all been through that kind of thinking. And here's the Lord Jesus, remember, he's only 12. He's not 20 here. Did you ever meet someone, and maybe they're 12, but they've been the head of a 30-year-old? Uh, uh, maybe uh, someone would say, an old man before their time. You hear that? Somebody's been describing that. Well, here we're told that wisdom involves much more than knowledge. Wisdom is heavenly instruction applied to earthly life. In other words, wisdom is applied knowledge. You see, you could tell your children all sorts of things, and you could give them all the advice of the day, but until actually that is applied, that's where wisdom comes into the thing. And so, remember Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph? They operated on the basis of wisdom in their lives. You ever think of Mary and Joseph? You ever think of Joseph? Uh, how he wasn't willing to make Mary a public example. Remember, he's engaged to a girl who is pregnant now, and he is not the earthly father. And so, all through his life, there was wisdom that was being shown. 
The accounts of Matthew and Luke present Mary and Joseph as being so dedicated to God that they listened to what he had to say and then they adjusted their lives to behave in a manner that was consistent with what they had learned from God. That is biblical wisdom. If there's one thing that you and I should desire daily, and that is that God would give to us wisdom. We don't know what all we'll face in life. We don't know. We don't know what a visit from someone will bring to us. We don't know what a phone call will bring to us. And how daily we need wisdom from God. And so, biblical wisdom. It's interesting that Luke describes Jesus at the age of 12 as being filled with wisdom at the age of 12. And yet over the next 18 years, we read, he still continued to increase in wisdom. If Jesus needed to increase in wisdom, how much more do we need to? The Apostle Paul, whenever he's writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 and 24, he makes it clear that Jesus not only possessed wisdom, but Jesus was wisdom. In verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. And so he grew in wisdom, practically. We're told also that he grew in stature. There was development. He was only 12 at this stage. He was not ready to go to the cross yet. That means that Jesus grew physically. We don't have a lot of textual evidence as such about how Jesus grew physically, where the Bible is silent as to whether he was very manly in build or whether he was more refined or that. And so we're not aware of uh, some of these different aspects of his life. But in his short life, his ministry took a toll on his body. And dear friends today, I, let us always remind ourselves that the ministry did take a toll. The Lord's ministry took a toll on the Lord's body. Remember, he's going to die at 33 years of age. He is the one who fasted. He's the one who was broken hearted. And of course, there's nothing will wear a person down more than stress. But do you remember the Lord Jesus whenever he stands and he weeps over Jerusalem? And he said, Would that I had gathered thee as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but ye would not. And so Jesus knew all about stress. Jesus knew what it was uh, to weep. He knew what it was to pray. We can assume that he took care of his body so he would physically be able to carry out the ministry that was given to him by his father. You and I ought to take care of our bodies. We may not always do that. We can be rather neglectful maybe sometimes, but we ought to take care of them. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whenever we are saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives. And thirdly, we're told that the Lord grew spiritually, because this verse tells me, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. Now it seems strange for Luke to write uh, these uh, afterwards. Uh, this was, uh, he was 100% God. And Jesus was also 100% human. He willingly yielded many aspects of the, his divinity during his time here on earth. And so he developed spiritually. He grew in favor with God. And the fourth thing that I want to leave with us this morning, he developed socially. He grew in favor with man. And we know that as we read the Gospels that not everyone was in favor with the Lord Jesus. Not everyone was. He came unto his own, but his own rejected him. They received him not. The thing that really strikes us is how balanced Jesus was in the development of his life. Now, I want to say, and you can dwell on these a little bit, there are five areas of your personal life that you need to keep in balance. 
And there's at least five areas of my personal life that I need to keep in balance. And if we don't keep them in balance, then we're going to be facing all sorts of issues. I'll not get time to get through all these this morning, but I'll go as far as I can. We're going to talk for a moment or two about you as an individual. Whether you're a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter, a brother or sister, whatever. We're going to talk about you for a moment. And I'm going to talk about me for a moment also. The importance uh, about our personal lives. Because if it gets out of balance, it will affect everything else. And so we need to keep that in mind. I, uh, I know that a number of you use UCB notes, as I do. Uh, I do be very blessed with them. Uh, as I've said before, I may not always stroke my T's and dot my I's, but there's some very good points in UCB notes. And I have highlighted a couple as I move on this morning. And one was on the 27th of February this year. Where it said this year, the gist for that day was focus on the solution, not on the problem. I think that is very wise advice. And maybe there's something today, and you and I, we need to focus on the solution rather than the problem. The writer of the book of Hebrews in 12 and verse 1 said, Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We do not live in a perfect world today. Remember, we're living in a sinful world today, and so there's a lot of things in this world that I'll not agree with, and you'll not agree with either. But God has called us to be salt and light in an imperfect world. There was a day whenever this world was created, perfect, was sin entered. And so I believe today as to how this sinful world will affect all of our lives. We're not living in a perfect world. And there's one thing, and I know that I made reference to it last week, and so I'm not going to be repetitive about it today. It is with regard to abortion. And I say that on the news I, last night as to how storm out again, I reckon that this issue has been too slow at being ushered in. Some of the parties feel that way. And I want to say, dear friends, it saddens me that my taxes and your taxes are being used to fund abortion. It saddens me. It saddens me today that our taxes, repair taxes, to fund the LGBT and many other ruthless organisations, and I'm sure the way Britain is going, the soon we'll be into euthanasia too. Right. What do we do in that case? You remember the Roman government, how it persecuted the Christians, the Christians, they used them as lampposts. And what did the Lord say to them? He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And I believe that in this world of ours, surely God chastises us at times, and sometimes we learn lessons in a very hard way, even as a nation. And so, remember, we do not live in a perfect world. We ought to focus on the solution, not on the problem. I'm going to finish today, because I see this clock is winding round, with another story, and for those of you that use UCB notes, you'll have read this just a... A couple of weeks ago, uh, it was the 2nd of March. And the theme on the 2nd of March, and I cut out some of these things, and especially if they speak to me, I cut them out. I have them uh, there with Batty for typing for uh, the next Gazette, because if something's a blessing to you, always give it away, because it'll become a blessing to someone else. And so on the 2nd of March, the UCB notes were simply this here keep persevering. Keep persevering. And I said this here, the mark, and this is a quotation, the mark of a successful person is his or her ability to see problems as opportunities instead of obstacles. Remember, we can focus on the obstacles. We have to look for the opportunities. And with all of said this here, the most important lessons that take place, uh, not only when you celebrate the good times, but you persevere through the bad ones. That's why the bad times 
make the good times so good. And then I know whenever I tell this story, for those of you that read the notes, you remember this, but it was about the baby giraffe. The baby giraffe. I thought it was rather interesting because I know nothing about giraffes. But the writer goes on and he said about the lessons that we can learn about a baby giraffe. That you will know that whenever a baby giraffe is born, the first parts to emerge are the front hooves and head of the baby giraffe. Well, I thought to myself coming from a farm, that sounds a bit like a, a cow. You know, it sounds that way. And then the entire calf appears, it tumbles out and it falls 10 feet to the ground and it lands in his back. And within seconds the baby rolls over and stands struggling to move those gangly, untried legs. Then it says something amazing happens. The mother of the giraffe positions herself directly over the new baby calf. She kicks it, sends it sprawling, and if it doesn't get up, she kicks it again. We well, say such a cruel mother to do that. And then I said, when it, it, it grows tired of the struggle, she gives it another kicking. In fact, every time the baby manages to get to his feet, she kicks it again. It may seem cruel to us, but she is preparing the child for survival. Unless that little calf learns to get up quickly and run I, with the herd, when danger comes, it won't survive. So what's the lesson for us today? This is the writer said. When life knocks you down, you get back up again. And I would say that to you, dear friends, today. Remember there are those of you here this morning. And I remember I preached from the pulpit too. I'm not exempt. And whenever life gives you a kicking and life knocks you down, what do you do? You get back up with God's help again. During difficult times, you learn some of your greatest life lessons through sheer determination. I'll come back to this, God willing, next week. I'll be finding the right balance in our Christian lives. We're going to sing our closing hymn, May the Mind of Christ My Saviour. And perhaps maybe this time we'll stand the same. us ever to 
get up again, to keep focused and to find our balance in Christ alone. Thank you again for all that we can learn from your word. Help us, Lord, just to apply your word to our hearts. Help us to bury it deep in our hearts that we might not sin against God. Pray for your blessing upon all the homes and families represented here in the house of God this morning. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen.